I was going to tell you, thank you for saying that because I can't tell you how many patients that I personally see that have come in and have had different pharmaceutical after pharmaceutical thrown at them, kind of testing the waters experimentally to see which one will, will, will take care of the depression or the anxiety or whatever it might be that they're being treated for. But something that, that is often done in general practice is doctors will use lab tests as objective measures to monitor treatment. But something that we rarely see done in psychiatry is using the actual objective lab measures to measure whether a response a patient's going to have to a medication. So I appreciate you pointing that out. Oh, it's, to me, that's my mission right there. I mean, it's it, it kind of like it's. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, repeat it every five minutes throughout the entire interview because I think what's going on is that in psychiatry land, I'll just give you my little pitch on this because I get on my soapbox really quickly and apologize for going off a little bit. But over in psychiatry land, we've had a vertical management system since the days of Freud, really. And that vertical management system is your patient, you're sick, you come in, and I'll review what's going to happen, what, what you're telling me, and I'll tell you what's going to happen with that. And, and that vertical management system really only looks at surface appearances. So all of our diagnostic codes are appearances. Think about it. Just take ADHD, for example. Uh, hyperactive, inattentive, and combined are all uh, surface appearance diagnoses. They have nothing to do with brain function whatsoever. They're just the way a person looks. And, of course, that encourages this vertical management system, diminishes feedback loops, so you really don't get uh, set up with a patient a feedback loop. And there's no really further exploration. So I'm totally into the science just to, you know, amplify what you're saying, Peter, and I want to, any anytime I have the least bit of resistance or where a person isn't getting well with a kind of a, a simple approach, uh, I'm, well, and, and let me put it this way, if it looks really basic and there are no complicating factors, yes, I'm going to use medication, but most of the people come in with complications because if I ask that number two question, then the whole world changes dramatically. We're going to review immune dysfunction, we're going to review hormones, and we're going to measure their neurotransmitters precisely before we go ahead and do anything, basically. It's quite, quite a bit of fun, really. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with you. So as a result of that whole thing, uh, I've changed my practice. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a guy in a, in a really significant state of transformation now. Uh, I would say this other thing about where I'm going and where I think uh, I would encourage all of us to think about. Yes, people don't use medications correctly uh, at times, and they use them quite frivolously based on uh, partly on the diagnostic code. So if you have a diagnosis that's bipolar, then bipolar people need this kind of medication or whatever. And many people who are bipolar suffer from gluten sensitivity or from... Uh, Celiac, or I had, I'll, I'll tell you in a moment about a patient I had who was a really significant corn, sugar, and uh, high fructose corn syrup uh, immune and was had numerous hospitalizations. I'll tell you about that in just a second. But the bottom line, if you find out what the underlying issue is, then you can come in, use medications productively and carefully, then correct the underlying issues, uh, re do the functional piece, which is a heal the gut, heal the um, areas of the body that have been compromised by the immune dysfunction, and then turn, indeed, turn the patient around. So what I'm getting at is I think there's a, there's a common ground there, which is really comprehensive medicine. I think what happens to over on the psych side, if somebody says they're interested in functional medicine, that brands you as a a reductionistically inclined vitamin person who only thinks that way. And on the other hand, all the traditional psych people, uh, the functional people tend to think of traditional psych people as, as only thinking that way. And I think there's a nice ground between where a person can say, well, I'm, I'm really practicing comprehensive medicine. If, if a person needs a psych med, we can do a little bit of that. We're going to do that carefully. And if they have these other issues that are present that are affecting their brain function or their body function, well, we would take care of those too. It's not like we're going to leave something, some stones unturned because we have a philosophic position that, that this or that doesn't make sense. And I think we have to just continue to do things like we're doing right here, Peter, is 
you know, tell people what's going on, inform the public. The public's going to change the, the practice of medicine uh, because what's happened, just even in my community, I remember years ago when I was doing vitamin D3, uh, the laboratories were, were asking me, what is D3? Why are you writing for that? Now, in my small community here, well, Virginia Beach is not that small, but, but many of the family practitioners are writing for it routinely. Uh, and I think so. I think the public changes. Uh, will cha ultimately change medicine. So that's a whole other issue. But I think comprehensive medicine is where I want to plant my flag and, and I want to listen to everybody that has anything to say that might be helpful to the patient. Amen to that. Well said. Thank you. So tell us then, um, tell us some of the, you said, you mentioned it before that you had a story that you were going to share about a patient um, sure, I, who's I'll hospitalized. Into, I'll, I'll go ahead and get into that. I mean, this uh, you know, just imagine this for a moment. A girl comes in, she's eight years old, and she's been seen by psychiatrists since she's been five years old. And she comes in with a diagnosis of bipolar illness. And she's significantly compromised. And she's had three hospitalizations, one of which occurred just recently when she freaked out. It was in the wintertime, ran out of the house in her underwear, and uh, said she wanted to kill herself and was hospitalized. That, that was the third hospitalization. And she comes in on a massive dose of psych medications, you know, atypical antipsychotics and uh, anti-epileptics. I, I, I can't remember, but I think it was like trileptal and risperdal or something very typically used for bipolar. And in the room with me in the first interview, She's there with her mother and her grandmother, and uh, she's completely wild. She's standing on her head, has no, no uh, long pants on, just her underwear is flashing all over the place, a dress on. She's acting, in fact, like she's less than five years old and she's eight. And we had to get her handled so we could just sit and talk. And she had a big uh, canker sore on her lip about the size of somewhere – so slightly smaller than a, than a quarter, but a very large sore uh, aphthous ulcer. Uh, and she had a history of aphthous ulcers on the inside of her mouth, which I asked about after I saw the outside sore. And her face is completely pale, dark circles under her eyes. I mean, anybody that has any awareness of, of this would say, you know, she's got an immune dysfunction. So I asked her the number two question, how many times a day you go number two? And, 